she's a PhD and a practicing psychoanalyst. She's the co-founder and director of the Philadelphia Lacan Group, uh, among her uh, many publications in the field which are relevant for us. I would mention the book The Puerto Rican Syndrome, published in 2003, winner of the Bediva Award and the Boyer Prize. Please select your gender from the invention of hysteria to the democratizing of transgenderism, published in 2010. She has, she has also just published a new collection titled Lacan on Madness. Madness, yes, you can't. Or published in 2015. And she's currently completing with Mania Steinkohler Lacan Psychoanalysis and Comedy, which is forthcoming uh, from Cambridge University Press in 2016. Finally, her new book, Psychoanalysis uh, Need a uh, uh, Sex Change Lacanian Approaches to Sexual and Social Difference, which is here, uh, will be published soon by uh, Rafet. So please join me in welcoming Patricia Garucci. Thank you. I'm very happy to have the opportunity to be here with you today. And uh, thank you, Chiara, for the invitation. Uh, because it comes at the perfect time for me. I am a complete <coughs> student of this book, Psychoanalysis Needs a Sex Change, that came to me as a sort of natural consequence of the previous book. Uh, from which I think you may have read some material. This is a book that was brought to me by my clinical practice, which is, I think, the, the privilege we have as clinicians, is that we have this sort of anthropological window onto society, onto changes in this course, that we get the chance of hearing things a little ahead of the moment when they will show up in the newspapers. So thanks to my practice, thanks to, to my uh, analysis, I started uh, learning uh, about interesting issues uh, of gender, gender identity, sexuality, sexual difference, sex. And uh, in 2010, I could not have known uh, when I talked about them or the democratizing of the transgender, I could not have imagined uh, the change that was going to happen. And I think in the last six years there has been sort of change, a sort of tsunami, it's not just a wave, a tsunami that has swept off uh, many of our preconceptions uh, and has really transformed um, and hopefully for an improvement and an openness uh, of uh, what gender is and um, not only at the theoretical, clinical level for psychoanalysis, psychiatrists, but also in the public eye. And I think in this short period of time, we had tons of uh, examples of the word transgender has entered the everyday vocabulary, and this is what uh, some recent studies show that most people, 80% of the population in the US, know what transgender means and can account for it in a uh, relatively reliable way. So it's still interesting to know that despite this uh, presence of transgender in the popular, popular eye, we have a sort of blindness in the psychoanalytic field, there is a, a tremendous exposure. Uh, and this has been for me really a, 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 almost an agonizing problem because I'm completing this book and every day at my coffee. In the morning, I open the New York Times, and there is, I think, every single day, some news in connection with something uh, of transgender. It could be popular culture, could be styles, the style section could be some uh, article about changes in the legislation. So I'm reminded every day of the urgency, but also was a little overwhelming for me because I felt like I never fully catch up because there was always something new I needed to account for. Happily, I, my focus is specifically clinical, so I have the constraint of my practice and of what my analysis teach me. The way I approach the practice is not applying psychoanalysis to the phenomenon that will uh, uh, analyze and maybe excise the truth from it, but rather let the clinic guide us. It's what can we learn as clinicians from transgender? And the shocking news is that in the psychoanalytic field, there has been a horrible history 
of heteronormatization, of pathologization in uh, the whole history of the most classical version of psychoanalysis, and not much has been produced besides prejudice. And uh, if you do a search, for instance, in Amazon with the word psychoanalysis and transgender, there are six titles that I'm happy with one of them includes my previous book. So there's only five other sources. And one wonders what's happening with the practitioners because I'm sure that they are seeing these changes in the clinic. How come this is not accounted for? And this is one of the things I, I address in this work. And um, what I will do today maybe would be take the opportunity since I have you taking this class, Gender and Domination, if you could help me maybe test some of the ideas I propose in, in the book and uh, maybe help me finally complete it and, and late for the publication. So <laughs> just wrap it up with your thoughts and send it to the press. So I will start maybe with very early theories, but maybe not early theories in terms of a psychoanalysis, we could go into that in the discussion, but rather in the history of every uh, child in contemporary society, very uh, original questions and explorations proposed by these budding researchers that children are. Children are not only very keen on exploration and investigation, they are very good theoreticians. And they not only pose questions, they have their own answers already before asking the question. That's what makes three, four-year-olds so annoying that often they ask a question, knowing very well what the answer is and checking whether or not the adult will really catch up and be able to give the right answer that they already know beforehand. So often the questions uh, children come up with are where do babies come from, how do mommy and daddy do it, what is the difference between a boy and a girl, and children are curious about sexual matters, and they come up with theories that are maybe could be compiled in a limited list. And Freud already noted this and gave us a very interesting and detailed list of what these infantile sexual theories are about, and um, frames this discovery with an interesting reflection, he said. In the text where he will provide us with this interesting list, he proceeds by uh, giving us this interesting observation and says that if we could divest ourselves of our corporeal existence, and would view the things of this earth with a fresh eye as purely thinking things from another planet, for instance, <coughs> nothing perhaps would strike our attention more forcibly than the fact of the existence of two sexes among human beings who, though so much alike in other respects, yet mark the difference between them with such obvious external signs. But it doesn't seem that children choose this fundamental fact in the same way as the starting point of the researchers, researches into sexual problems. So already from the start, sex and problems are connected, and, and it's interesting that Freud invites us to imagine ourselves divested of our corporeal existence as maybe bodiless beings, pure thinking beings, he says in the quote, maybe from another planet, and then we will be able to see things with a fresh eye. And then, free from our embodied existence, we will be able to realize that sexual difference that so much is made about are really something that could be in any way impossible to, to neglect. That being in the body seems to make us not see the obvious. So what happens to children? The young researchers, in the desire to know, produce interesting speculative theories and I will share them with you because they, they are interesting to, to take a rapid look at. So we see how their scientific curiosity transforms the curiosity into a sexual problem. The first theory that Freud gives us is attributing to everyone, including females, the possession of a penis. Theory number two would be uh, if the baby grows in the mother's body, is then removed from it, this can only happen through only one possible pathway, the anus. 
The baby must be evacuated like a piece of excrement, like a stool. Number three, if babies are born through the anus, then a man can be given birth just as a woman can. A sadistic view of cohesion, interpreting the act of love as an act of violence. Theory number five. In a marriage, a couple urinates in front of the other. A variation of this, which sounds as if it was meant to indicate a greater knowledge symbolically, is that the man urinates into the woman's chamber pot. In other instances, the meaning of marriage is supposed that the two people show their behinds to each other without being ashamed. Uh, infantile sexual theory number six. The list that produces is only 11, so we have five more big discoveries to make. Number six, the baby is got by a kiss. So, multiple variations of how to think of sex, safe sex uh, contraception, perhaps. Number seven, the theory of the Kubar is a sympathetic pregnancy which is, as is well known, a general custom among some cultures in which the father, during or immediately after the birth, also takes to bed and uh, complains of having labor pains and is accorded equal treatment to that provided to women during pregnancy and after childbirth. A rather, and Freud gives us an example of a rather eccentric uncle of these patients stay at home for days after the birth and uh, the child visit his family and found the father in a dressing gown, for which he concluded that both parents took part in the birth of their children and had to remain in bed for a couple of days afterwards. Number eight, a girl heard from her schoolmates that the husband gives his wife an egg, which she hatches out in her body. A boy who had also heard of the egg identified with a testicle, which in German is vulgarly called by the same word. And he racked his brain to make out how the content of the scrotum could be constantly renewed and removed. Number nine, a girl may arrive at an expectation that intercourse occurs on one occasion only, but that it lasts a very long time, 24 hours to be precise, and that all successive babies come from this single occasion. And then the two last theories, one, number 10, other girls are ignorant of the period of gestation, the life in the womb, and assume that the baby appears immediately after the first night of intercourse. And the last one is a theory that uh, Freud says uh, occur to children as they become wiser in sexual matters, and then produce, of course, a much more sophisticated theory, which is your father and other people may do something like that, but I know for certain that my father would never. <laughs> so this is the last one. It's interesting to know because they look very colorful, naive, but we see maybe reverberations of these, or echoes at least, of these theories when women may be offered today thanks to technology the possibility of freezing eggs. And eggs could be bought could be sold. Uh, maybe we see perhaps technology proving that infantile sexual theories are not maybe so infantile and they're theories that could be realized in the practice. And that has of course psychic consequences. So maybe we have to revise the theories and we will soon come up with some technological means of realizing them. What I think is interesting to to know also about this, the child sexual interest, the many shapes they adopt, that uh, confirm that these questions are not new, they are as old as humanity, and already the idea that we need to pose a question but it implies that sexuality is something enigmatic. For instance, if sexuality would not be something for which is there is no clearly uh, knowledge, if it would be purely regulated by instinct, there wouldn't be sex ed in school. Why do we need to be educated on sexual matters? Why do we need to have a manual? Why do we need to be instructed? So it means that it's a knowledge that is not a given, that needs to be acquired, revised, redefined, and that, as Freud says, is always problematic. And this is what helps us maybe uh, and as analysts, maybe make a living because often, and Lacan says it in a very uh, crude way, all people uh, talk about.
about in the session is about not just sex, but in most cases, butt fucking. Excuse my French, but it's how he says it. And that there is something wrong with sexuality, something doesn't fully work, and produces often symptoms or at least variations of suffering. Sexuality often arises either too early or too late or is too much, or not enough, or is too passionate, or not passionate enough, and we could go on and on. on this discrepancy, there is something that is not fully fitting, we don't know how to deal with it, and we are never fully satisfied by it, and keep on searching. There is something interesting in this discrepancy and success that keeps, maybe, humans moving, maybe moving from one partner to the other or attracting one partner to each other, partners attracting uh, to each other, but what makes one partner or one person sexually attractive, attractive or attractive to other is something that we don't really consciously know. What makes us tick is uh, something that is in most cases unconscious and unknown factor. Uh, is a je ne sais quoi, this uh, something that Nabokov called the loving and lingering detail that uh, made Freud conclude, for instance, and this is an interesting take. Often uh, Freud is taught that this uh, old chauvinistic peak who doesn't like women, and indeed he was a result of his time and some of his ideas who maybe not survive a feminist critique. But it's interesting that he had a very non-normative position facing sexuality. His concept of the drive proposes a drive that is skewed, uh, whose object is completely arbitrary, accidental almost. And uh, he proposed that the uh, attraction of two people to each other, be it homosexual or heterosexual or anything in between, is a uh, and I point in Freud, a problem that needs elucidating and not a self-evident fact. So we see that he's uh, not very normative in his position, Freud, and opens the possibility of maybe a reading that would allow for more gender fluidity and maybe a more open attitude than one often ascribes to a psychoanalytic reading. Uh, today, of course, talking about gender seems to be obvious that we all know that gender is a construction, so do we assume that the attraction of uh, two people to each other uh, will necessarily be motivated by a sort of predetermined natural attraction of a uh, male to female is a completely ridiculous assumption? Uh, we are even getting rid of the boy-girl distinctions. Uh, now I think big uh, companies like Target are eliminating these sections for pink and, and blue and uh, so maybe we are seeing a, a change that the sections for toys, bedding, etc. are no longer qualified and perhaps for the cohorts of uh, maybe a generation ahead of you for let's say the, the post millennials or generation Z uh, maybe the idea of uh, male and female is a total anachronism and this is for this an example, I don't know, maybe you saw this Jaden Smith, that look, he can look super cool and masculine on a skirt. And he was chosen by Louis Vuitton for the most recent campaign, interestingly enough, of women's wear. So we still have this division of women's wear, but he's embodying a model that is uh, maybe, I don't know what you would think. Is it androgynous? It is a. Uh, gender blend, you know, maybe to change uh, metaphors. Maybe we need to say that the, the wall between the sexes has maybe experienced the fate of the Berlin Wall. Now they're picking the pieces and trying to figure out what to do with them. And, and, and this is interesting that in this uh, situation, the transgender experience could give us interesting insights into what to do with the pieces of this fallen wall. And um, I think today the idea of, of uh, transgender is uh, in the public eye, and I think it became the, the climax, I think, in the popularization of what I call the democratizing of transgenderism. 
was uh, with the public uh, coming out of Caitlyn Jenner, here is in the cover of Vanity Fair, and uh, the gender mutability is part of the quotidian vernacular. So I propose to put gender in the blender. And we have now a trans America. Uh, and as a result of that, we see that one interesting, and you may know that better than I do, uh, the, the idea that now gender fluidity is exploding the options. There was an article on, on the Sunday magazine in the New York Times. Now we have multiple choices. Was, I don't know if you, did you see this? It was in the magazine, was uh, referring to, to this uh, uh, episode of the series Girls, uh, in which uh, is the change of pronouns, how the pronoun they could offer for even more gender fluidity. But still, there is paradoxically a need to label. So, in the need, the tension between the multiplication of labels, which would perhaps grant more fluidity, we have more labels. And in Facebook, one of the maybe spaces to, to test this, uh, we have now 58 gender options. Uh, I want to read you the list. You can see, I have three pretty things. Go from A gender to cisgender, to pangender, transgender, two spirit, transsexual. So uh, the variety of uh, gender choices seems to be exploding to the point that then in the UK, perhaps competing with the American version that have 58, they came up with 71 choices. And, but this is about identity. What's happening maybe with sexual attraction. So if we look at maybe OK Cupid, uh, we will see that uh, they list 12 categories for sexual orientation, of course, the obvious gay, straight, bisexual, but also asexual, demisexual, heteroflexible, homoflexible, pansexual, queer, questioning, sapiosexual, for those who consider intelligence the most important sexual prey, which I think for people in an academic setting, <laughs> exciting. Uh, but we have, we have 22, so apparently there is more uh, identities than maybe uh, options in terms of orientation, sexual orientation. Uh, in many cases, my impression is this will continue growing. And, and we may wonder why, why is this proliferation of atomization of choices? And uh, what I would say is that one thing that is confirmed would be a psychoanalytic uh, idea, which is that at any rate, Sex, what psychoanalysis calls sexual difference is something that exists and persists. There is an attempt at, at capturing it, but the explosion of labels also is a symptom that it cannot be fully grasped. For psychoanalysis, sexual difference is neither sex defined by anatomical or hormonal determinations, nor gender or the socially constructed roles. Uh, normally ascribed to men and women. Gender is something that we may say needs to be embodied, so the gender has to be made flesh, and sex, that would be the anatomical, needs to be symbolized, it needs to become maybe a metaphor. So sexual difference may exceed the notion of sexuality, since it has to do with issues of embodiment and challenge the taking up of a body as sex and more down. So for psychoanalysis, the body is not it's sexual, but this sexuality has to do with the fact that that, that body has a yogurt and expiration date. And that complicates embodying a sexual being. And, uh, and there are issues of embodiment that this is what I will address. My position as a psychoanalyst differs from uh, that of maybe queer theory differs from a medical position, takes into account the contributions of queer theory, which I find is often the space where psychoanalysis can encounter a, a very interesting interlocutor, but still maintaining difference. Uh, because psychoanalysis, for instance, is not so uh, focused on identity. For psychoanalysis, identity is always uh, created in alienation, in identification with another person, 
and in the unconscious something resists identity. So maybe we could talk about that in the discussion. On is in something that uh, Lacan put in a aphorism that maybe you heard around, called Il n'y a pas de rapport sexuel. There is not such a thing as a sexual relation. And my Cyrus give us an example. Not really. I'm, you, I know you want it. So we see that supposedly for somebody who is trying to embody a sex symbol, there is a misfire. There is always a mismatch. Uh, being a man, being a woman, or anything else altogether is one of many possibilities of failure. That assuming a sexual positioning is a way of failing in sexuality, and we may fail better, but fail again as Peckett said. So the idea is that there is no completely stable sexual identity, it's sort of work in progress, and we try to make the best of it, uh, and of course, people, when Lacan says there is no such a thing as a sexual relation, it doesn't mean that people don't have sex. People have sex, people fall in love, uh, but there is some, and people assume an identity. I think this is one of the interesting things in society that Freud observed early on, that the first assumption we make upon running into a stranger in the street is male or female. Why do we do that? Why do we that? We live in a society, we function in a way that we need to maybe establish difference, right? That would be my proposition. Is it about male or female, or that we need a limit and a norm? And maybe this is what we are talking about, the possibility of finding other forms of establishing this difference that may not necessarily be the maybe all male-female premise that we already have for a long time. So maybe it's, we are seeing new manifestations of maybe organizing systems, and we see that this, the, this idea of opposition and difference already in the unconscious in, and is betrayed by language, that is language works in opposition and difference. So, here we have maybe the possibility of uh, uh, going to another uh, way in which psychoanalysis has discovered in the unconscious Difference is inscribed, uh, and it's of course a bad way, it's a failing way, a symptomatic way, and you may have heard it, is by way of the phallus. And uh, for the unconscious, there is no inscription of sexual difference, there is a very failed system that, when, if you recall from the infantile sexual theories, everyone has a penis. And it's interesting, if we read Freud, we could confuse organ and signify. For Lacan, he uh, separates this, and the phallus for Lacan is strictly a signifier, but a signifier that is a representation of something that inscribes, is a placeholder. And uh, we can see my desires in a way, embodying a long tradition of a uh, phallic premises, and if we think this is uh, ancient Greece, you see that the phallus is this tremendous, gigantic prop that nobody can have or be. And the assumption of sexual identity, and of course, the matter of genders, anatomy, and destiny, that Freud already said that a long time ago, but there is a, an interesting a process in which a certain truth will be constructed around uh, the body. So, no longer a destiny in the flesh, but rather a, a, a complex and conscious process of a certain unconscious evolution. And, and we see that, for instance, uh, in the uh, new uh, pronouns, we no longer maybe by using he or she, but there is the use of the pronoun they, as that was in that article in the New York Times. So we, we see that at times language is, is paralleling or determining a process of change, that, they, that there is no predetermined, there is no truth, instinctual truth. That doesn't work for speaking beings. So, I'm very interested in what I learned from the, my experience with patients who identify as trans, 
is that some of them seem to assume a sexual position in not fully relying on what the psychoanalysis has called the phallic. And uh, at times I have patients, my, my interest in, in transgenderism started with patients who will bring questions about sexual identity. Uh, and they were posed as questions of sexual orientation. They were uh, patients that would mostly identify as uh, women. And they would say, I don't know if I am straight or bisexual. So it looked like an issue of sexual orientation. In the classical presentation, let's say 25 years ago, that type of question was presented as a question of identity. Am I a man? Am I a woman? I am feminine enough. Am I living up, living up to feminine ideas? And then I compare these uh, presentations with cases of uh, an artisan who identified as trans for whom the suffering was because they felt very certain about their identity. I am a man or I am a woman, but their bodies seem to be in contradiction with that. However, there are other uh, analysts who may identify as trans who seem paradoxically to, uh, here we have Lacan talks uh, about urinary segregation, and, and it's an issue that is now being discussed in the public arena. Do we need to uh, continue segregating by gender the restrooms? And they see you say no. What I think is interesting for me, we have here this is Saussure's idea that uh, we have a signifier, even more for three, and signify, that would be the idea of the tree that is attached to this wall. Then Lacan opposes that to a funny story. He talks about the anecdote of two little uh, brother and sister, two kids, traveling on a train, and through the train window, they arrive at the station, and as the train is pulling into the station, the little boy says, oh, we arrive at ladies. This is, in, this is in, Assume it's a train station where you would have the restrooms would be on the keys where the train would stop. So from his keys here sitting opposite each other in the train car. Through the window he sees, oh, we arrive at ladies because from his perspective, they are just the train has stopped in front of the ladies, the restaurant. Where the girl says, no, hey, you idiot, we arrive at gentlemen. Because she's sitting on the opposite end of the car from her perspective. On from the window, she sees this other door. And what Lacan says that when we have these two sexes, they position each other, excluding the other sex, and creating a sort of risk from which they will never understand each other, a sort of establishment of misunderstanding, and they can only define an identity in opposition with a sex from which they, to which they will feel no uh, inclusion. So it's the boy says, we arrive at ladies. The girl says, we are a gentleman. And we could see that but this opposition is ridiculous. Because if you take out the ward, the doors are identical. And inside, what you have is toilets. And they, what you would use a restroom for is the same thing. So it's creating an artificial difference. And this is one of the things that happens to speaking being. We need to, in a way, inscribe a difference that, as if you recall the quote of Freud, it's not really such a significant difference. Why do we make it so enormous? And this is the poster of the movie Transamerica, that we could talk about in a very interesting film. But what interests me, and yes, please. And in this country, we have segregation. to you is why it goes too far when you have too many options and you have too many transgender maybe or different gender bathrooms or different options does that will that create a problem or do you foresee a problem at, at least in this country I can't speak for any other country because I grew up here in America I yeah. mean I grew up during segregation so I, I can't speak on that yeah and it's interesting that I can call it urinary segregation because if you go in a private space in your home, 
bathrooms, it's just a bathroom, it's like a kitchen. Right. Our kitchen gender, why our bathroom? But we're talking about public spaces. Exactly, why is it that in the public sphere we need to introduce the difference and that doesn't exist in the public space. And even, look at this sign, oh, this is cool, we have an, an inclusive restroom, but for me what is interesting that we have this. But will there be a backlash? Why do we need, sorry? Will there be a backlash eventually? Like there was yeah, there has, there is now, right now. They passed recently a law banning the possibility. I think the states are fighting. Yeah, yeah, sure. A year ago, I think, in the White House, they have a gender-inclusive restroom, but they had passed laws because from people who oppose all inclusive gender said, oh, it would be terrible to have in the ladies' room a trans woman. So there would be a big danger. Some people would argue that. I'm not convinced by that argument, but there is a a biological woman, a cisgender woman, is somebody who identifies with the gender they were declared at birth, is no, is, is in danger if uh, a, a trans woman uses the same restroom. Which is interesting because if you, you were mentioning in America, yeah. we could do, yeah, I think she said wrote on toilets, how different are the toilets in different countries. I, more, I, I would maybe add to this uh, scatological uh, compendium, by noticing that, for instance, in, in Europe, if you go to a public restroom, the door is completely hermetically closed. So once you're in the toilet, you do your business, right. nobody sees you. In America, it's always see-through. When you are, especially in very public space, like an airport or a shopping mall, there's big, the doors are never fully closed. Oh, little gaps so, you're talking about? The little, the little gaps, yeah, okay. so you are in the toilet, and if somebody would be walking in, in the skew where you could, look inside and see what's happening. So there is maybe the idea of whether it's the idea of transparency or that the public and private space needs to, to satisfy the very basic need to poo or to pee, you need to declare an identity. And, and you, you may know many cases, I hear that from, from an artisan, it could be excruciating, because it could be a, a trans man in the early stages of transition who wants to use the restroom and which one could she use? I think what is interesting, and I put this example there, there are many found a few. And even when it's all inclusive, unisex, what we don't get rid of, and this is something for us to think, why do we need the line? Even when it's all inclusive, the all is barred. And maybe this is about castration. Maybe we talk about that as another complex psychoanalytic uh, notion. I cannot talk about cases for reasons of confidentiality, so I would pretend this is an analysis. You may know her, that's uh, Lily, the wife of the so called Daily Bell, because the family is in fact, the, the novel original is about the cis wife. I have you seen the film? Yeah? Okay. No. <laughs> well, I will kill the plot for those who still want to see it. Uh, what shocked me in the film, where, I don't know, did I answer your, your question about the, the I, I just, I just, uh, I was thinking there might be a, a huge backlash adventure, not like the one we're having in the States, but I say it's just like a whole, you know, what we had during segregation, like, it's just going to be a reversal. Yeah. I, I don't know. Or, or not. I, 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 no, I can't predict the future either, but I just think... Um, I think, I think in, in terms of... Uh, there is still a lot to be done in, in the U.S. in terms of racial relations, but I think we are not as bad as we were in the 50s. Correct. But don't I, don't, I don't believe we are in, in, in a wonderful place, and, and this is something we could discuss. But, I, I, I could foresee some improvements. What is interesting, we go back to this, is can we do without difference? Maybe the question. And why is it that we need to impose it? Because to go back to the previous slide, I think even though we get rid of difference, it's over imposed. Yes. Why are we so afraid to get rid of difference? But even when, the interesting is that even when we get rid of difference, because this will be this still there. Still there. Yeah. Right? Yeah? Yeah? <laughs> But let's see. Sure. Yes. I, I just wonder why we would need to signify or any way. Why they can't just say gender gender neutral bathrooms instead of putting a picture of what they think a person should look like. Or yeah, so restroom. Yeah. Just a sign. This is if you need 
need to think not yet. <laughs> All you need is toilet. And, and I will give you an anecdote, maybe to add to the maybe multicultural array. I was this summer in a public swimming pool in France. And I was surprised because the showers were not gender segregated. Everyone needed to take a shower, it was mandatory to go into this public swimming pool. So everybody was there with the soap and the bathing suits on, but so it was, I, I had never seen that before. But then there were restrooms, so it was a public, the restroom was not, it was a restroom with shower, but then there were the little toilets too, and they had a door said women, and another door said men, said, uh, men. You opened the door and they were exactly identical. So I was wondering why? Okay, they have time, we take the shower together. Why do we need? And, and I think there is a need to introduce perhaps a limit. The question is, can we find other ways of writing maybe a norm, a limit that will not be Despite the fact that there is a still like, on the same track of uh, the kind of like indispensable desire for labeling and identification. So I mean the fact that the track has not uh, changed uh, like I mean that much uh, doesn't actually uh, affect your argument that you need to. I think what we never get rid of is the need to introduce a norm or a difference. The question is, can we find other norms that would be less oppressive and would make less people vulnerable or excluded from the norm? Because when I was giving you the example, for some people, this uh, labeling of the public restroom leaves them where they feel there is no place they could it's safe to go to. For a trans person, maybe neither of the labels apply. So but why is that? Do you think it's unavoidable to have a, a norm for the other? What, apparently that's how the, the unconscious fails at recognizing difference. So as a symptom, we reproduce a multiplication of failed answer to this impossibility. And I think it's and happily, and, and in the same way we are talking about segregation, I think there is a, a certain unconscious predisposition to uh, not accept the other in its otherness. And I think we eventually learn, and this is discontent in civilization, to live better with others, tolerating our own psychic limitations. And the idea would be, could we come up with norms and ways of writing sexual difference that would be less oppressive? We're talking about gender and domination that would be within a different parameter. Or at least if this is the only way, that would be maybe more democratic. Could be. I, I, I'm not very optimistic about human nature, but I think that improvement can, there is a little room to be to fail better. That's that's my idea. We will fail, but a little better. That the idea that we always will come up with answers that will be symptomatic, but not all symptoms are as uh, crippling, as upsetting, as painful. Yes? Yeah, I mean I just can't help but saying this just maybe as the last question. So I mean I'm, I think that uh, after all you are still kind of like adopting psychology. And uh, there is a kind of like, uh, I would say, maybe a confusion of, I'm not, I'm not saying that your argument is con confused, it, it is maybe in the psychoanalytic theory itself, uh, of interpretation and action, because like after all, uh, you have to uh, act and behave, uh, and that's maybe what, what is to, uh, ident like I would say, determine uh, what is our sexual orientation or Whatever. I mean, um, so I guess maybe uh, to be like critical enough is to uh, discern uh, different spheres of like maybe to uh, criticize the correspondence of 
uh, legal uh, um, required, I mean, uh, legal needs to uh, establish norms, mm -hmm. uh, like, because it is like uh, unavoidable, of course, unavoidable. But, uh, and to descend that sphere from the sphere of like, you know, our uh, everyday uh, social encounters and, you know, communications, uh, maybe, for example, based on friendship, which is, which, in which uh, no norm is like needed per se by nature. So uh, what I'm saying is that uh, maybe your um, angle of view in I mean in criti uh, criticizing it or like to be optimistic is uh, so broad that uh, it kind of like falls short of you know uh, more minor and maybe uh, more uh, determining uh, situations and spheres. So I don't know. If well, maybe we need to think of different sphere. There is maybe what we hear in the clinic and how a psychoanalyst intervenes, which is not the position that, and like we are talking about legislation, that's beyond the scope of influence of a psychoanalyst. And our limitation, we work in a case by case, and it's a very particular, uh, limited intervention. However, I think with a tremendous impact in the life of someone, if you I'll assume that the psychoanalytic space could grab a little bit of freedom, could be a lot in the life of each specific analysis in each specific cure. What is very limited in terms of the political power of psychoanalysis is that each treatment is unique, each treatment is in a way untranslatable, and it works for one person in a specific moment of that person's life. So, I don't, I don't think that psychoanalysis would be the politics of revolution. Then we could have discussions as citizens, and then I would talk as a citizen, we have a critique, in, a political critique that we could contribute. I think there are different spheres. And what I think there's an ethical responsibility, nevertheless, for psychoanalysts as clinicians not to adopt a retrograde, horrible positions, which has been the tradition of psychoanalysis. I could give you plenty of examples that for many years, psychoanalysts have thought, for instance, that homosexuality was a disease, that, and in that sense, psychiatry, which is very correct, that was moved farther along and faster than psychoanalysis. In the 70s, psychiatry decided, of course, psychoanalysis is a uh, behind because the psychiatrists in the 70s decided that homosexuality was not a pathology. For psychoanalysts, it took until the 80s. And in trans issues, there are, even recently I saw flyers of the conference here in New York saying the most absurd thing that what is uh, what does Superman have between the legs? We don't know. Who cares? You know? <laughs> and why is sex determined about what you carry between your legs? It's, and it's uh, something that tends to be, and, and this has been observed by many uh, critics, many activists, trans activists. For instance, Janet Mock has, a, if you look online, and I strongly recommend it, a sort of mock interview. And she's aware of the double meaning, in which she has a journalist, identifies as cis, being asked the same ridiculous, intrusive questions that you see. Often there's a sort of recurrent mediatic presence of trans stories. And you have this uh, interesting interview that reverses it. So you have the trans, the, the trans woman who is openly identified as trans interviewing the cis gender woman saying, when did you realize you had a vagina? How often do you use tampons? Tampons? Are you sure you're a woman? Mm, I'm impressed. You really would never have figured out that you were a cis woman. Which, of course, we realize how ridiculous and how terrible is the presentation in media of uh, the, the trans phenomenon. So I think it's important for, and, and it is an enormous ethical responsibility for psychoanalysts to avoid repeating this. Uh, horrible tradition, and, and I think the clinic allows us for that freedom and in a way compels us. So I wanted to show you an example that is 
choice, but more like an ethical choice. And I want to stop there because maybe we have the missing links in my presentation to your questions because I, I would like to hear you. Yes. Um, what I wanted to ask about the data that we said um, there's a need for labels versus like a multiplicity of labels. Um, so this seems to be to like define gender identity formation to the need for differentiation. And like the social, so the social tendency to differentiate. Um, and you said like the unconscious is failure to recognize difference, which we seek to reaffirm by like reproducing difference. Um, but then you also said there is no truth with regards to gender identity, right? And um, so I wanted to know what do you think of like this recent abundance of possible like gender identities and sexual orientations? Um, which I mean, on one hand, I know it stems from like body in contradiction with like your gender identity. But with that being said, like there are like categories, like for instance, you talked about the safety of sexuality earlier, um, which to me at least is a very problematic category because I I think it's like an invention of the Tumblr generation and it just reeks of like. Of superficiality and like um, elitism almost, um, and I think this sort of points to like the problematic nature of the fragmentation of gender. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you could say something about that. Maybe. I think you, you already have a lot of elements in like maybe in your question okay. to, to answer. It's really like when I was saying that. Children more the are, are, are less naive than the parents who believe that they are giving the right answer. That in fact children are very true. They, they, they know better. And, and they are testing whether or not the adult has, 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 has learned the truth. Okay, they have learned about the bees and the, and the flowers and, and they are testing how, how naive the parents can be. And I will be in the position of the parents. I'm very naive when I think you have you have the answer. I, I, I believe that for, for the unconscious, sexual difference is a problem. Like for children, sex is a problem. And for the parents, sex is a problem because they have to have the talk with the kids, maybe with the kids, with adolescents. And, uh, and I think for the unconscious, uh, there is this sort of uh, impasse. There is not a clear answer. And we could assume, nevertheless, uh, are sex beings in different ways. Like the body is sex. The reality of the unconscious is sexual, and we learn to deal with it. But we never can fully account of why we suddenly feel an attraction or feel attracted to things. We are attracted to someone, a passive thing that somebody catches our eye and we don't know why. Or why we prefer this and we don't prefer that in terms of sexual practices. That there is, I think, a, a tendency, and I agree with you. You label, it's as if everything would be a conscious, consumeristic choice. Right? So, well, you have your, you like somebody's brain, or you like somebody's toes. Yeah, but why not? Because I think we should not, I think that the danger is normalizing. And, and I think the labels could give you the illusion that there is a better choice, or there is a preferred choice, and well, if you like toes, you like toes, or if you like whatever you, but I think there is a discourse as if this would be a conscious, consumeristic choice rather than an arbitrary unconscious. But, but on that note, what you said gender identity is not tied to, shouldn't be tied to like, you know, a sense of aesthetic, but it's an ethics mm -hmm. almost. Well then should every claim um, for gender identity be considered legitimate? Because I think often the demand is no, it's more to accept I am, I exist. Okay. So it's more like an ethical choice. And I, I left it out and this philosopher here. I, I, I take as an example the idea that, because uh, often I, I was uh, surprised about the, the beauty of beauty that is often invoked, at least in the, in the media, or oh, so and so has the transition and they look so beautiful. So what's the function of beauty? Is it a denial of castration? Is it a denial of the limit? Is it a denial of mortality? Or, uh, if we take the example of Antigone, what is this beauty? It's about maybe uh, of overcoming the limit or dealing with that limit, I mean, whichever gender or agender position one chooses. That there is something 
in, in the realm of art, in the sense of uh, creation. Uh, art as artifice, or art not just as both art, but art as a how to learn it, to, to, to make do with our bodies in whatever sexual identity we manage to inhabit. Yeah, if I can, uh, uh, my question also revolves um, throughout your talk on this question of multiplication, uh -huh. right? This <coughs> increasing multiplication of gender categories. Now, a label is by definition a given a name to things is a way to cope with anxiety, right? So the first step in order to cope with um, something that is anxiety generating is giving a name. Give a name, you control it. We learn it from the Bible, right? The first um, operation is naming things, mm -hmm. right? Giving a name to things. So on one hand, it seems to me that the proliferation of gender categories is a symptom of an increasing anxiety about um, whatever is going on under gender. Uh, on the other hand, it is also true that the the most of labels gives the illusion that you can control it, right? And so in this sense, it can actually uh, further contribute to the repression of the problem, which then it seems to me it comes back um, in a, a under disguised form in, in the sadomasochist scene, where actually the number of roles is reduced to two. And, and as, as I was mentioning before, I'm really coming also from a different country, mm -hmm. Italy, where gender roles are more traditional. Mm -hmm. I always say we have the Pope, so uh, this keeps it as a stabilizing effect, like constant uh, reminder. The Pope, not the move. <laughs> <laughs> so it's uh, the the southern the, the southern the BDSM scene is not so old-fashioned, whereas I see that in context where gender roles are more fluid. There's an attractiveness of uh, the southern mother scene, which I can't explain to myself. If not that it's the whole uh, business revolves business, the contract revolves around there being a very simplified cause. I mean, for me, it doesn't matter whether you are the dominant or the submissive. What I think is attractive is that there's no multiplication. There's, there's the script, which you can discuss the detail, and then you can uh, um, use the detail as a way to cope with your anxiety. But what I think is is, uh, is attractive is the fact that like, you're going to be this for whatever uh, length the <coughs> sexual act is going to take. This is your role. So there's no possibility of. I don't. What do you think? Yeah, I think the, the proliferation of labels made me think, is, is, and it was saying in the beginning was the logos, right. but as soon as we create the label, we invent what the label determines. Right. So when we are inventing these categories with which we can identify, so we already that betray how alienating the process of identification is, but has a pacifying effect. We need to declare, especially in the context of the US, one needs to declare an identity and is often predicated on just one phrase. And you may recall from your experiences in high school where you sit in the lunch room. It has to be it's predicated on a really terrifying segregation machine in which one phrase reinvents a group that is defined, what clues the members of that specific group is that phrase that excludes the others who don't share that phrase. And, and But the paradox is that the more labels we have, the more complex it becomes. And I was thinking of a kind of Borgesian library, label library, that you don't know where to put this book because it could fit in many libraries. And then it's the kind of infinite and fail attempt that what I think we see that there's something about subjectivity that exceeds the label. And the attempt of labeling is trying to encompass and limit them in the same way that we could qualify in uh, an S and M contract who is the top, who is the bottom, and contain maybe the uncontainable of the drive, or maybe the 
complex support, yeah, and for those in the legal profession know all very well, as soon as you have a contract, you have the potential for litigation. And then you need to hire a lawyer who will reinterpret the letter of the contract and figure out that what is written this, but in fact it means something else, otherwise we don't have judicial system. The, even when you have a contract, it's subject to interpretation. So there is always a leftover that I think has to do maybe with, if you think in, from a psychoanalytic perspective, that there is something of the drive that cannot be fully domesticated. To define no. for the As a clinician, purposes, but yeah. for, for the continuing of the treatment, uh, then maybe it would be interesting like to create possibility of questioning these labels and these, uh, in order for, to create a, a movement, to create a narrative, like uh, uh, in order for, for the subject to appropriate himself with some of the in the, But in a psychotic patient, that could be dangerous, on the other hand, like to question uh, an identity, and therefore it would lead to different forms of uh, interrogation. Yeah, as analysts, we don't question because we, anyone questioning is in the danger of being in the position of I know the truth and I question you, you don't know it. An analyst listens and conducts the treatment and maybe tries to work with the analysis to help the analysis pose the question. Uh, maybe will help the analysis to go as far as the analysis wants to go. I don't think one should an agenda, and that's why it was so bad that for so many years psychoanalysts have been so heteronormative and, uh, and absurd and are probably very inefficient in their practice. Because if you, who are you as an analyst to question the analysis? If there's somebody there to question, maybe the analyst and the analyst, questioning the analyst that is not in the position of the master, but in the position of the driver conducting the treatment. So, and in that sense, we never, and every time we hear a label, that even if a parent says, I'm very happy, what do you mean by that? Or I am very unhappy, what does that mean? Or I am a woman, yes, what does that mean? Or I am not. So any, any time there is a, a, any declaration of labels should be suspect, but not because we question it, because we know what the real label is, but rather, if I think the aim of analysis is the revelation of the truth that is unconscious and it's a truth that neither the analyst nor the analyst and know in advance emerges in the treatment as even we could say the hypothesis of the unconscious is something produced in this and maybe tested in the treatment. We assume if we hypothesize that there is an unconscious. In the treatment it will be produced by the interaction of analyst and analyst and it will transform both. Yeah, in this respect, I uh, what do you think of the Oedipus uh, complex? Because of the first striking uh, um, element in your, in your talk is that you never mention it, although it could have been implicit in uh, the bathroom triangle, right? So, uh, as a matter of fact, psychoanalysis as a discipline has been invented uh, by Freud, I mean, a man of a genius, and who managed to transform his own sickness into a discipline, mm -hmm. but still he did so uh, within a context where the family structure was a, a very peculiar one. So it was very much mommy, daddy, child, right? So the, the, um, the division, like the difference was inscribed, and it was inscribed uh, in the Oedipus complex mm -hmm. as a uh, transform from something that's contingent the European mononuclear family into our truth of the unconscious itself. Now, if psychoanalysis needs a second, as you argue in your book, and, and, and I think it's, uh, uh, you're totally right that it needs one, can it get a sex change without getting rid of the Oedipus complex? And uh, um, even more so, particularly now that uh, gender roles are not so are no longer so um, determinant in terms of reproduction. In that respect, perhaps even the invention of the pill should have already um, meant okay. We can get rid of uh, the Oedipus complex because now, I mean, reproduction is no longer 
uh, associated with sexuality in the way it used to be before. So what do you think about this? Well, one answer was already perhaps given by Lacan himself. He proposes what he calls, what we call sexual different. He invents this word sexuation, and he said that every subject has to undergo this assumption of sexual positioning. He calls that process sexuation, and is not fully determined by the Oedipus complex, because for some, indeed, it's completely dependent on the phallus, but not for all. And not all are fully subjected to the phallus. And he proposes this 